All right, church, we're going to uh, go at a sermon today. Pastor Jake and I are. Uh, by the way, worship was incredible. The words that were shared were incredible. Yes. And I'm greatly appreciative Amen. of them. They fed my soul um, in a tremendous way. Uh, the title of today's sermon, if you like to write stuff down and take notes, I'm going to give you the title right now. And the title is Name It, Claim It. Oh, yeah. Uh -oh. Name oh. It, Claim It. Come on. Come on. This Can I get a hallelujah? Can I get a hallelujah? hallelujah. Um, the, that truck is mine the, in Jesus' name. The sermon title alone is going to put Oscar's Honduras uh, sermon in in pretty serious jeopardy of being the most watched. Um, once this is Google, we'll get a lot of hits. But I can assure you, only hit by five hundred. If you've arrived here from Google, that you might not listen long. Name it, claim it. Okay. Uh, as we progress in our study as a church family on faith. We have to keep in the forefront of our hearts and our minds the necessity of consistency. Yeah. Can y'all say consistency with me? Consistency. consistency. Okay. Uh, consistency. We want to be consistent. Yeah. Okay. I don't want to have this great faith at one point in time in my life and then have a floundering faith and then get picked back up again and have great faith. Though we know our faith kind of flexes based upon seasons and life and situations and all of the above. I know that, and you know that too. But we don't want to be faithful and then faithless. And faithful and then faithless. We want to be faithful. Yes. We want to be found consistently faithful. Why? Because that demonstrates growth and trust in the Lord. Yeah. The only way to establish consistent biblical growth as it relates to faith is to engage in a walk that actively places yourself up against things that are beyond your capabilities, yeah. okay? And we live in a culture where that is hard. Yeah. You might have to choose to do that. Yeah. Just like the human body was designed for difficult things, we tend to appease it, pacify it, and make it comfortable. But your body, what if your body wasn't designed to always be comfortable? Yeah. What if you really are healthier being in uncomfortable situations? Yeah. What if you really are healthier when you spend 20 minutes a week in freezing ice water? Mm, <laughs> to all the cold plungers, they're like, yes. Hallelujah. I'm not getting off on science. I, I, I hardly have time to, to capture that subject but I'm willing to do it um, maybe in another season of life, okay? But what about our faith? You stay comfortable. The faith gets weak and small. True. Yeah, that's true. We stay real appeased. Our faith gets small. We have to put ourselves in situations or think a certain way where we have to actively engage Right. Our hearts and our minds with the fact that if God doesn't come through right here, we won't make it. It's true. And you don't like that, nor do I. Yeah. Now today we're prepared, prepared to approach this sermon with this title, with the full out aim to fly in the face yeah. of the very worldly expression that it tends to present. Regarding faith. The way this is usually presented falls very short of the standard outlined in God's word. Yeah. As was the case last week, our perspectives were very much challenged. And we were spurred towards growth as we yeah. take into account that his voice is really trying to lead us. Yeah. He's going to speak to us this morning. Can y'all go to Deuteronomy chapter 8 with me real quick? Come on. Deuteronomy chapter number 8, and let's go to verse number 16. In the wilderness he fed you manna, which your fathers did not know. Why? So that he might humble you, and that he might test you, to do good for you in the end. You ever pause to consider that very expression right there? Okay? We've read this part. He, he, he uh, fed you manna. So that you would be humbled, so that you would be tested, but why? So that he could do good to you in the end. That's good. You know what kind of faith that requires? 
a faith that doesn't immediately see how it's all working out for the good. Mm-hmm. You know how many times I pray the prayer, Lord, you're going to work all things together for good to those who love you and are called according to your purpose. And I'm saying it not as much because I believe it, but because I want to believe it. Mm. Because when you don't see it around you, when you don't think, oh, this was supposed to happen. This was supposed to be like this. I was supposed to lay my hands and they were supposed to be healed and all of the above. And yet, if my faith is contingent upon how I thought the outcome should be, I'm selling myself and certainly the Lord short. Yep. Of what he desires to accomplish in the end. Yep. And I'm worried about the manna today. Come on. Yeah. He promised to do good for us in the end. Yes. And that's why he was testing us. That's why he was humbling us. Otherwise, this verse 17, and nobody wants to say this, but sometimes we're on trajectories that make it to where we will have to say it, mm-hmm. but nobody setting out would want to say this. You would never want to say, my power and my strength and my hand has made me this well. You would never want to say that. You would never want that to be Mm. even a freckle of thought, if that's such a phrase. But even a a tiny thing of a thought. But yet sometimes our trajectory leading up to that is going to make us say that exact thing because we forced, we pressed. It's not It's not laying back and saying, oh, God will do it if he wants to do it. No, it's active faith. We're going to run you over doing the will of God, but we're going to trust him yeah. in his process of timeliness and the provisions in the time he gives it because I know he's testing us so yep. that he could do good in the end. Mm-hmm. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. This is where faith comes in. Yes. Yeah. I don't ever want to look at anything and say, look at what my hands and my strength and my wealth have done. So I'm nice and happy to be broke. And nice and happy to have short, chubby hands. And I'm nice and happy to be powerless. Amen. Because then you can't say anything about who you are and what you've done actually did it. Uh-huh. Yeah. That's good. We're gonna set. We're gonna set out to build a building next year. Yes. And we have maybe six percent of what we need to do it. Amen. And you know what we're gonna do? We're going to start. Come on. Because everything that's ever been built in any of our lives, we started without what we need, and then we watched God do it. Yeah. Come on. Amen. There's not a single thing that stands, whether it's a family, a home, a person, or a structure, that. We had what we needed when we set out to accomplish. Uh-huh. Right. Right. Not a single solitary thing. Right. It's good. And the Lord is not going to break that rhythm now. Nope. With constructing the place that you'll call your home. Uh-huh. Yeah. He won't start now. Come yeah. on. But 18 says, But you shall remember the Lord your God who is giving you the power to make wealth. When he gives you what you need to do what he calls us to do, we'll know that he gave us the power and the ability to make that wealth. Yeah. So that he may confirm his covenant, which he swore to your fathers as it is to this day. Name it, claim it. Why did we title it that if we don't like the expression? Because that's what we do. (laughs) Okay? What is it? Well, we're going to keep our title, but define what we mean when we say it. Name it, claim it. (laughs) I've literally, I've stood in rooms with men who call Jaguar dealerships and told him on the phone that God told him that they should have it and gave him their address. And he believed that if he was faithful, he'd wake up in the morning and the car would be, car would be in the driveway. Oh, I didn't spend a lot of time with that person. No. <laughs> they wound up being crazy. But when you're young and you're trying to find spiritual people to walk with, you bump into who knows what, who knows who, yeah. who knows where. Uh, he scared me a few times, but luckily I outweighed him so he could do nothing to me. Um, but he's like, Zeke, I'll name it, I'll claim it. That Jaguar will be in my driveway the next morning. He was asking to borrow money from us the next week. You can, you can look it up on the internet, and maybe you shouldn't if you're impressed by uh, certain televangelists from the 70s and 80s. 
But if you're impressed by, if you're not impressed by them, look it up and become a humble, faithful critic of their methods. But he says, as he's ordaining, one faithless man of God, gold and silver have we plenty. He's mocking the word of God. Yeah. Where the men say, gold and silver have we none, but in the name of Jesus, Come on. get up wall. Yeah. That's what I want to say. That's ministry. There are showmen on television saying, gold and silver have we plenty. I got news for you, they all got jets. Look it up. You'll have a good time looking at it. Okay? Funny, funny people criticize us. Maybe I should send it somewhere else for a while. Okay? <laughs> Pastor Jake brought this up this morning. I hadn't remembered it, but it would be like him to bring this up. There's people that believe that, and God bless them, they're trying. But if you name it and claim it, you can pick up the mantle of a deceased person. So they go to graves and they suck them. Okay? They, it's called grave sucking. So you stand over the grave and you would take a deep breath. And you could receive the mantle, maybe, of someone of old. Okay? Well, they got one thing right. That sucks. That's not the standard of the word. That's not how God's word works. But that's the name and claim it type of ideology. So that's only three little examples, and we don't want to pick on anyone else because we want to be kind in our generation. Okay? We're talking about name the case. It was kind? It was kind of like fun because Exactly. That was uh, Pastor, so Zach. Pastor Zach is <laughs> over here to the right. And his email address is... Uh, <laughs> the name that we're talking about is name the faith of the Bible. Name the faith. Name the position. Name the place where God's telling you to stand. Yeah, that's, good. that's the soles of your feet in the middle of the flood water. Yeah. Name that. And then... Don't claim the produce, don't claim the car, don't claim the victory, claim the faith yeah. that it takes to then stand in that spot. Yes. And yeah, that's man. it. Yep. Name the faith that you need. Like, yeah. Lord, I'm struggling right here, right now. I don't believe that you can do this. Name it out loud, Lord. I want the faith to believe you for this. Yep. Name it. Talk to the Lord about it. Tell him you're struggling and name the faith. Lord, I want to have the faith to believe this. Come on. Then claim it. In other words, every word you speak upholds it. Every vision you have upholds it. Every song you choose to listen to upholds it. Every show you choose to watch upholds it. Claim it. Yep. Hold it. That's good. Name the faith yeah. and claim the faith. Come on. That's Last true. week, we talked about these elements. Pastor Zach and I were mentioning the things that war against our faith, like fear and failure, like discouragement and doubt, and like pride and power. Well, today, we're going to talk about name it, claim it. And Pastor Jake and I are going to do our very best <clears throat> by the power of God yeah, to right. convey this in a way that stirs us yet further. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? Amen. 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 So when we think of name it, claim it, and those examples that Pastor Zeke was just giving us, we think of the, the aura around that, how those men dress, how they, how they speak, how they set themselves forward. It's pretty arrogant, pretty prideful. It's as if they think they've attained to a certain kind of faith to speak as if they were God themselves. That I can declare anything to be mine. That I can, compl that I can declare... Or, or declare, de that I can declare an outcome right. to be. That I get to decide what's going to happen here yeah. because of what I believe. Yeah. And as Pastor Zeke speaking, I think of that scripture where Paul's speaking to the Philippians and he says, He who began a good work in you will perform it yes. until the day of Jesus Christ. Yeah, will bring on. it to completion. Yeah. Yeah. So if he has already said that he would bring the work to completion... Yeah then what sort of insecurity do I have that I must talk about what God said he's already going to complete? That I have to declare that something's going to be done. Well, the odds are is I'm talking about something other than what God is talking about. If right. I have to declare something to be done. He has said that he's going to bring this work. 
the, the work in you, the work that he's going to do through you, that he will do it, he will bring it to completion. Mm. Yeah. And so we think of how arrogant we must, those men, not us, in the name of Jesus, we will allow him to humble us so that we will not carry with us an arrogance that, that, that displays that we think we have some power in our own selves. That, that scripture in Deuteronomy chapter 8, it goes on. Pappy and I were just talking about it the other day. Amen. When you come into a land and you live in houses that you did not build, right. and you drink water from cisterns that you did not dig out, when you eat fruit from trees that you did not plant, be careful lest you think that you have made yourselves wow. right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes. The Lord said, I did all of this. And so we are content when we say name it, claim it. We are naming that faith yeah. and claiming it that yeah. we will hold to it. Yep. That what God has spoken, he will carry out. And we will claim that position yeah. knowing that he will bring it to completion. Yeah. Exactly right. Good. Peter said to Jesus in John chapter 6. Everybody was there to name and claim their extra bread in John chapter 6. Jesus said, you came to me. These are the name and claim it types. You came to see the miracles, to see the wonders, and to eat physical bread. You wanted to be full. You wanted to enjoy physical... What, you know what I'm saying. You wanted to enjoy bread. You wanted to enjoy the entertainment. What is Jesus going to do next? And he said, fine, eat my flesh and drink my blood. <laughs> Everyone gets a little bit difficult, you know, a little uneasy because it's a difficult thing to say. And the disciples look at Jesus and they say, Jesus, everyone's leaving. This is, how can you say that? That's a, this is a hard thing for people to hear. And Jesus says, would you also go away? <laughs> and Peter responds and says, where else would we go? Only you have the word to have. Yeah. So we're talking about a faith that is humble. Yeah. That says, whatever are the outcomes, it's because it comes from your mouth. It yeah. comes from you, Lord God. That's right. That's I right. am claiming, I am naming and claiming a faith that says, I will stand where you have called me to stand. Claim that strength that you've said you would give to me to endure. And I will see what you will perform in yeah. the end. Yeah. We're talking about having a humility that is, humility and faith are inseparable. Mm -hmm. Because faith is that very thing that is, I am throwing my entire self on the Lord, waiting for him to come through. Yeah. When arrogance creeps in, it wages war against that humility, sorry, against that faith. Mm -hmm. You lose faith when you begin to obviously trust in something other than the Lord himself, which is arrogance. If Pastor Jake's going to talk to us a little bit or refresh our memories a little bit on the word halak. Uh, before he does that, I wanted to this thought about how often <coughs> we engage in conversation regarding the greater measure of faith that we must aspire to walk in and how often the conversation is about the outcome. And not the measure of faith. Does that make sense? Like, I'm going to have faith and this is going to work out for me. Yeah. And my mind is often so emphatically set on the outcome <laughs> and not the faith that is being cultivated and worked up in me as a product of mm -hmm. yeah, the process, if you will. Yeah. So the faith that I want to walk in is the faith that I'm claiming. I'm going to walk in this. <clears throat> then all of a sudden my faith becomes strong no matter what is produced. Now God works everything perfectly. He's working in a scope of time that you and I know nothing about. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you're seeking to live righteous and upright and you're obeying him and what he asks you to do, then you do yourself a great disservice to try to quantify those outcomes based upon your measure of faith. Okay? Your measure of faith is simply, am I believing God and doing exactly what he says right now? Mm -hmm. It's not greater faith to take it into my own hands. It's greater faith to believe that if I do exactly what he says, then in the midst of that entire process, I have faith that 
It's not about produce. It's about the position I'm in. Yeah. My spiritual position, my yeah. spiritual condition. Does that make sense? Yeah. Your faith is established by the process, not the outcome. Because if you yeah. believe yeah. God yes. would right. heal you, and you believed it for for a whole year, I'm going to be healed, I'm going to be healed, and on month 13, you died. Did you not have faith? <laughs> and the reason we're walking through this is because the Lord's going to believe, I'm sorry, the Lord's going to entrust us to believe Him for big things. <laughs> And you all run with people who think, hey, the Lord will rule it. Don't worry about it. We're not going to be that. We've also been with people, at least I have. In fact, they've, they've challenged us at funerals. That, well, the person died. They must have not had faith. Something must have been wrong. They didn't have faith. That's, that's error. That is error. Um, that outburst happened in this church, and we disregarded it immediately. Because that's error. Yeah. That is biblical error. Mm -hmm. And in light of all that, in light of those two camps, how are we going to be a people of faith that sees the supernatural power of God on full display? Yeah. To see healings. We're going to see the dead raised. Yeah. We're going to see miracles like we've never seen. Amen. And it'll be because of our faith. Yeah. Yeah. Our faith. Yep. Genuine, biblical Gospel-centered faith, yeah. yes. not hype, not show, yeah. not any of the sort, but faith. And then, no matter what the Lord chooses to do, our faith is still very big, very strong, very attractive to the nations. Yeah. Because what the Lord chose to do, I am still satisfied with. And we're going to see that today. Pastor Jake's going to help us a lot. A lot. Anybody want to be helped a lot? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So the exercising of our faith accomplishes this. It draws us very near to the heart of the Savior. And then the aim is not merely supernatural manifestations, though yeah. we want them and welcome them. That's still not the aim. Right. The aim is this intimacy Amen. with the God of the universe. Yeah, sure. And from that intimacy, He can use us. He can perform such miracles through us. He can entrust us with His precious work. We want to be that people. Come on. We want to be the people that are madly in love with the presence of God yeah. and madly in love with all that He does. And we're not enamored yeah. inappropriately by the supernatural manifestations. Come on. Yeah. So if we have 50 prophecies on a Sunday and 25 healings, praise Jesus. Amen. But that Sunday won't be better than the Sunday where... There is pure worship. Yeah. Yep. And just people weeping. And then a good word. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You think I'm you think we're gonna walk out of here and measure mm. the faithfulness of this Sunday by how many prophetic no. words were given? Never. No. Never. Well that's occurring, church. Yeah. Because Never. everybody is basing their faith off of mm. a good word. An inaccurate perspective. <laughs> they can see. An inaccurate perspective. They can see. Okay? But we're gonna walk this way. Yeah. We're gonna walk. Yeah. We're gonna lay our we're gonna we're gonna lay our hearts a hold of this authentic yep. faith that allows us to be a people where the supernatural moves and works. Hey, we don't limit him. Prophesy, pray in tongues, pray healing over each other. Yeah. But we're about the intimacy that's produced from that yeah. process. Yeah. We're about being near the heart of the Lord. Yep. Yep. Um, you guys remember the word halak, right? Yeah. While Pastor Jake talks to us about that, everybody get ready to go to Psalms 119, if yeah. you will. Psalms 119. So, so write down Psalm 119, yeah. verse 45 in particular. But I want to also draw your attention to Genesis chapter 17. Genesis 17, you're going to begin in verse 1. Before I read that verse, God appeared to Abram. <laughs> spoke to Abram, called Abram, said, I'm going to make a nation of you. He said, I'm going to... Benjamin Levi, you're going to have to go back with your mother. Oh. He said, I'm going to give you this land, the land of Canaan. 
He told Abraham, this land will be yours. And then you know about the stars in the sky. All these things that the Lord spoke. The promises that were made to, to this man named Abraham. Are you in Genesis 17? Yes, sir. Yes. Let's hear everything that Abraham has to do to make sure that this land is his. And it goes to his descendants. That this land um, is conquered. For, taken from the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Gergeshites. Yeah. Okay? Let's see what the Lord says. Now, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. Come on. Amen. That's what God asks of Abraham. <laughs> yeah. Everyone say halak. 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 This is the Hebrew word for walk. <laughs> yep. Now, do you think God was just asking Abraham, like, oh, no, I want to check out your gate, Abraham. Can you walk, walk before me? <laughs> like a shoe salesman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> Get in step, babe. So, obviously that's not what that is. This word halak, it means, it can mean to simply walk. Putting one foot in front of the other. It can also mean live a certain lifestyle. Live. To walk, to live. It's a how you live your life. And he says, Abram, I am the Lord Almighty. Do you know what he says? I am God Almighty. Walk before me. Yeah. Or in my presence. Walk before my... Live in my face is exactly what he's saying. And be blameless. This is what the Lord's asking of Abram. He doesn't say to fight anybody. He doesn't say sharpen your swords. He doesn't say to do any one thing in particular so that he can conquer the land, so that he can have lots of kids, so that he can fulfill all these promises. No, that was for the Lord to do. Abram was told, you walk before me and be blameless. Live before me, Abram, in a blameless way, according to my standards as I reveal them to you, Abram. You live in holiness for me. Be a living sacrifice. Amen. Offer your life to me. Amen. Blameless. Something that's acceptable to me. That's, that's wrapped up in this phrase. I'm not elaborating inappropriately. This is what that means. Yeah, perfect. Abram, walk, live your life in my presence and be blameless. Amen. That's what I'm asking of you. Do you know what God does with a man like that? Well, it's Abraham. So I don't think you struggle to answer that question what does god do with the man who hears this command walk before me julio just walk before me and be blameless do you have any idea what the outcomes are no you don't and maybe it'll be less than glorious according to your current perspective but if you can walk before him and be blameless i guarantee you there'll be nothing that you lack come on man. psalm 11945 david Listen to this. This is beautiful. I will walk. Everyone say walk. Walk. I will walk. Remember, it's not just a couple of steps. It's a lifestyle. I will live in this way. In what way? In freedom. Everyone say freedom. Freedom. I will live in freedom. That's a wonderful thing to claim, isn't it? Yeah. Come on. But how? Why is it that David can declare that he will walk in freedom? Well... Because I have devoted myself to your commandments. Amen. This is the demonstration of one's faith. Yeah. You name it. What are you going to name? You're going to name what faith? What kind of faith? This faith. Faith that observes his commandments and his testimonies and walks blamelessly like Abram and walks in his commandments like David. And you know what the produce of that? That is a lifestyle of freedom. Yeah. And you can even leap all the way into... Into the Newer Testament where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. freedom. Being led by His Spirit, living in His presence, there is freedom. Because you have the faith to take heed that you walk in His way, yeah. regardless of the situation. Yeah. That is true faith. Yeah. We are naming that faith, the faith of these men, the faith that is to adhere to God's Word no matter the situation. And we are claiming that ground, that we will walk in freedom, that we will walk blamelessly, 
That's what we're naming and claiming this morning. Yeah. We said we were going to use um, some of the more common Newer Testament phrases. We said we were going to use uh, men and women from the Older Testament and the faith and many things from that. We said we were going to talk about understanding this from the proper perspective and how we must view Israel. We're going to do all of those things in the course of this series, uh, but we're also going to do them in each sermon. So, uh, Newer Testament phrases. Y'all want to look at a couple yes. and try to get some fresh perspective on them? I'm going to give you two uh, that Pastor Jake and I uh, are going to go through and couple some Older Testament passages within them. But the first one is, haven't seen faith like this in all of Israel. Go to Matthew chapter, I'm sorry, go to Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. I'm going to start at verse number 1 wow. while you're flipping there. When he had completed all of this discourse and the hearing of the people, he went to Capernaum. And a centurion slave who was That's highly true. regarded by him was sick and about to die. When he heard about Jesus, he sent some of the Jewish elders asking him to come and save the life of his slave. When they came to Jesus, they earnestly implored him, saying, He's worth, He is worthy for you to grant this to him, because he loves our nation. Yeah. And it was he who built our synagogue. Now Jesus started on his way with them. And when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends and said to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself further. I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof. Mm -hmm. For this reason, I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But just say the word, yeah. and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I have soldiers under me, and I say to this one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my slave, do this, and he does it. Now keep in mind, verse number 9, and I encourage you to study this and ask the Lord to speak to you regarding it further, but this next statement that comes out of the mouth of Jesus is a very profound one, yeah. to say the least. But the Bible says when Jesus heard this, it marveled him. And he turned and he said to the crowd, that was following him. Okay? There's a crowd following Jesus. He turns and he looks at them and he says this sentence. I say to you, not even in Israel have I found such yeah. great faith. Yeah. When those who had been sent returned to his house, guess what? They found the slave in good health. Yeah. Okay? What if they went home and the slave wasn't in good health? Did what Jesus say about the centurion still stand? I believe so. Yeah. Yeah, it does. Yep. But this is an intriguing interaction, wouldn't you say? Yep. And in the midst of the perplexity that some may have regarding this statement, probably at that time, and especially now, something... Very clear and concise emerges from the com emerges from the conversation that Jesus had and his response to what the centurion stated. Yeah. Now you look at what it reveals, though. Keeping this short so we can keep moving. It reveals that a proper position or a plain view of biblical authority is attached to faith. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Why sometimes are we not seeing the miracles? Well, because God didn't want it. Well, perhaps. And perhaps you're still the God of your life. Mm -hmm. Perhaps I'm still the God of this area of my life. What made Jesus stop and marvel at a statement? Like, you can't even come to my house. I didn't come to you because I'm not worthy. You can't come to me because I'm not worthy. But say the word and it'll be done. And he says, I too am a man under authority. Mm -hmm. I say to this one, come, he comes. I say to this one, go, he goes. Yeah. And so the man 
is expressing a faith that allowed for the supernatural to occur because it was a faith that was built upon a surrender to biblical Amen. godly authority. Yeah. He knew that Jesus had the power to heal or not to heal. And he was still submitted to that yeah. authority. Yeah. Jesus. Yeah. Right. Yeah. See how connected to faith? That's mm. a point. Yeah. That's good. Being under the authority of Jesus and all of his teaching really is. Yes. Yeah. Come on. There's some times where our prayers are hindered. There's, the Bible speaks of all this. I'm not going to go into all these. But our prayer life could be hindered. Our walk could be hindered. Uh, miracles could be hindered. These things could be hindered because God is not wanting to do them. He's not answering. Or because we're still the God of the situation and he's wanting us to be broken yeah, down. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. He's wanting us to get to the place where our faith is big. Faith that is bigger than a mustard seed. It's big enough to move a mountain. But it's because we know that he is our ultimate authority. Then our language literally can be, if the Lord wills it. Well, most people say, if the Lord wills it, because they don't want to believe God could actually do something miraculous. Yeah. But I'm, not, I'm saying, don't say that. I'm saying, I'm saying, say, I believe. And I believe that whatever my God chooses to do, I'm going to love it. Yep. But I believe he's going to heal this person. And I'm going to pray until he heals them. Absolutely. Have that kind of faith. Yes. But not from the place where you are God over it. Right. But where you are trusting in his lordship over it. Mm. Yeah. And that's just skimming the surface. Yep. But what emerges here in this simple conversation is that a proper position, a very plain, proper view of authority is directly linked to faith. Yeah. And could it be that the mm. key to the kind of faith that it takes to move mountains, to see the dead raised, to see bodies healed, to see families and marriages restored, to see the sick recover, to see salvations spring forth in great manner, could it be that it all hinges upon our ability to walk humbly under the authority of our almighty God? Mm. Yeah. The answer is yes. Yeah. And the answer is yes every time. Yep. He's going to do it his way, and he's going to ask you to do it his way. Yeah. And it's not magic. It's not like, oh, we thank it, it's cute, we're praying it, the Lord's going to do it. We're praying for a certain number of men to be at this altar in this month of December. Yes, and the month's zipping on by. Yes, it is. Now, we've had faith. <clears throat> we've been praying for them. There's different men that the men in this uh, church have brought up, and we're praying for them. And it's intriguing. Uh, we were praying for them the other Sunday night um, while standing under the bike shed in the pouring down rain um, and just talking and smoking a cigar. And, and <clears throat> we started praying. I think Zach's text message about prayer because Daniel and I were in the house talking. So we actually were not even a part of this miracle. Dang. We were there, but we were there. About 10 20, started praying, and uh, an individual texted an individual at 10 50 that we had been praying for. The prayer began to move the heart of the men we were praying for. Yeah, that's crazy. That stirred my faith. I think I'm just going to hope the best for people, I'm going to hope that they get it, I'm going to hope that it. That it, that it works out and that yeah. they wake up. But am I going to pray? Yeah. The Lord's asked me to pray. Yeah. Yeah. What if my people pray? Yeah. Yeah. What says casting crowns? No. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's Chronicles. <laughs> humble themselves. Call by name, name, but humble themselves and pray. But I heard this song in my mind. You know what I'm talking about, Bruce. You want to come up and sing it, Bruce? <laughs> I know you would. You're getting ready to get up. Man, you're crazy. Yeah. What if we prayed? What if I fought in prayer for those souls? Would I see? Yes, because he wants me to come under the authority of what he asks. Yeah. And then we're going to begin to see him move. Yeah. That's how he works. Yeah. Amen? Amen. Yeah. 
All right, we're going to link another New Testament passage just to Luke chapter 7. Yeah. Uh, but Jake's going to rock Daniel 3 for a few minutes. Y'all feeling that? Go to Daniel chapter 3. You're going to love this. So we're talking about a faith that is submitted to the Lord, that he is going to, he's going to cultivate, bring about the outcome that brings him glory, that pleases him. And our faith is, to, is what causes us to stand in that place of, what seems like chaos or turbulence, like the middle of that Jordan River flood stage, and we stand there and we call upon his name and we watch and see his hand move. Yeah. That's the faith we're talking about. Yep. Are you in the book of Daniel, chapter 3? Yes, sir. I don't need to say a whole lot about this story because you know, a lot of you are familiar with the narrative of the three young men, the friends of Daniel. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. Come on. I am going to go to verse 16. Okay, These are the these three young men that are named here are the friends of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, are their Babylonian friends. They're Daniel's, yes. They are from Bolivia. Christina. But listen, verse 16. So, what, how did they get to this place? They have refused to submit to another authority. Come on. One, because, well, if you worship... Adonai, God, you don't bow to anybody else. Yeah, man. Right. And that's reason enough. But you know what? If you want to get really technical about it, he said don't bow to anybody else. Amen. That's so right. that's why you don't bow to anybody else because he said so. Yeah. And, and these three men are under the authority of the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Jesus. Amen. Come, on. Come on. And so he says, listen, Make your decision. Give me an answer. Bow to this image or you will be thrown into the furnace. And you will be burned alive. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. Why? Because God didn't tell us to. I know you would like an answer. But I'm not giving you an answer to the question you asked me. Because, well, all due respect, sermon coming sometime soon. It's in the notes. It's in the notes. We don't need to answer you in this matter. These men are men clearly under the proper authority, aren't they? That's right. Look at verse 17. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire. And he will deliver us out of your hand. Come on. Okay. Right. I want you to observe the faith yeah, here. They didn't say, you can try to kill us, but you're not going to kill us. We're going to live. We're going to survive this situation in Jesus' name. <laughs> they didn't say that. They said... Well, one, we don't need to answer you in this matter. Yeah. <coughs> but we do have something to say. Yeah. Sorry, I'm going a little slow here. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, Thank you Look at verse, the beginning of verse 17. If it be so, like, if you decide that you want to throw us into this furnace, if that's what you want, you're going to give the answer. Not because they're not me. So if you decide, if it be so, that you throw us into this furnace, Our God whom we serve, not your God whom we serve, our God whom we serve, is able. This is not faithless. They're mainly stating mere fact. Yeah. Our God is able, which is actually very, uh, very faithful to say such a thing. Yeah. Our God is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. This is kind of like saying, whether we live or we die, we are delivered from your hand. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Verse 18. But even if, everyone say even if. Even yeah. if. Even if. These are men that have a faith that's not entirely concerned about the outcome. The faith is true faith because the outcome is left in the hands of God. Yeah. Their faith is true faith because they're just that's doing right. what God told them Amen. to do, right. which is not bowing to any other God. Amen. They won't worship another God. Yeah. Outcome, so be it. God holds the outcomes in his hands. We're not concerned about that. He will deliver us from you, O King. Amen. 
if it be so. So, so even if, even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. It's good. I don't know what's going to happen, but I can tell you what I'm not going to do. I'm not going to disobey my God. Do you understand? Walk before me and be blameless. That means keep my commandments. I will walk in freedom because I have devoted myself to your commandments. Doing what God has told you to do and not ceasing to do so is the greatest expression of faith. Because it brings about all kinds of consequences when you decide to walk in obedience. Some favorable, some not so favorable, but those outcomes and consequences have no binding or bearing on whether or not you obey. And if you obey, that is your display of faith in your God. That is the faith we're naming this morning and the position that we're claiming. Amen. We're standing in this place with these three young men. Yeah. We will not do something that our God has not told us to do. Come on. Right. And so when we say this name it, claim it, I'm not going to claim something that my God didn't tell me to claim. Amen. That he did not say would be. I'm not going to speak it. Yeah. I'm not going to put myself up on his level. I am under him. Amen. If he didn't say something's going to happen, I'm not going to say it's going to happen. Come on. Right. I will let him speak. The answer comes from the Lord. Amen. What I will do is I will stand in faithfulness. I will display my unwavering faithfulness by being committed to a standard of obedience no matter the situation. Mm -hmm. To stand in the midst of chaos and obedience, that is faith. Yep. And to do it as long as you're required to do it, whether it's ended by your death or your deliverance, which is pretty much the same thing, that is faith. Yep. Yeah, come on. Good word, That's Jake. good. Yeah, it is. Matthew 17. I was just making sure the man of God was done. <laughs> Segway. Matthew 17, you go with me to verse number 19. And uh, we'll look at another New Testament conversation about faith. And then we're going to get Pastor Jake to Hebrews chapter 11. Come on, oh. wasn't that good from Daniel yes. chapter 3? You know how that uh, if he is able is not a lack of faith? Because they walked into the furnace. That's how you know there wasn't a lack of faith. Yeah. Or they thrown in, however you want to look at it. Matthew 17, verse 19. The disciples came to Jesus privately, and they said, private conversation it got published for the whole world to know. The private conversation. You ready, Jesus? Why could we not drive it out? And he said to them, because of the littleness of your faith. And here we go again. Talking about the size of faith. I want faith the grain of a mustard seed. Mm -hmm. The littleness of your faith. You couldn't drive out <laughs> it. <laughs> but he said to you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you'll say to this mountain, move. From here to there, it'll move, and nothing will be impossible. So pick up in verse 21, please. But this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Yeah. Anybody ever fasted and prayed in this room? Yeah. Everybody still awake with me? We're almost, yes. we're almost coming to a close. So y'all want to be fired up and ready. If anybody ever fasted and prayed yeah. with the pure motivation to see your faith strengthened and your God move? Mm. And anybody ever done that and still had a little bit of motivation that you had this outcome that you hoped he would do? Yeah. Yeah. But don't feel bad about that, of course, because you want this demon to be cast out. Okay? <coughs> but we're still attacking the notion of us being enamored by the outcomes as opposed to the process right. that builds the faith to arrive there. Mm. Come on. That's okay? good. And as we're approaching that, we think... You have this private conversation. Jesus, why could we not do it? I want to be able to cast it out just like you did. He said, your faith is so little. Well, how do I get my faith bigger? It comes by prayer and fasting. Okay? Now, how about this conversation? 
This is an interesting one because it talks about the littleness of faith. And for many of us, we will hear this and there will be this shift in the way we ought to think regarding faith. But I don't want it to be a thought. I want there to be a shift in our actions because action is required. Because what Jesus says in verse number 21 about prayer and fasting, you know the purpose of prayer and fasting? If you starve yourself enough, God will see that you love him and then move on your behalf. Do you think that's fasting? Mm -hmm. I'm not so sure. That's at all what fasting is. Tear your hearts, not your garments, said the prophets. Yes. This, yeah. this fasting is about intimacy with the Lord. Yes. Prayer oh, is about intimacy with the Lord. Yes, Lord. How do we have the kind of faith that can cast out demons? Yes. You've got to be near the Lord. Yes. You say, well, I could have told you that. Well, then why aren't we walking it? Why? We're not seeing miracles. We're blaming everything except our own intimacy with the Lord. Yeah. They want a private conversation. I want to be able to do this, Jesus. Then you better get near the Father. You better have the kind of faith that is built upon intimacy with the Lord and not presumed outcomes. You don't have greater faith because things always go your way. You have greater faith because you're near the heart of God and you're aware of what He wants to do. Come on. Now we're going to see from a few Older Testament places that faith has everything to do with intimacy and walking with God. Yeah. What if you never performed another miracle the rest of your life, but it could be said of you by everyone that knew you that you walked with God? Would that be enough? Well, I hope it would be. And if you actually walk with God, He's going to perform His work through you. So it goes without saying that you won't have one without the other. Come on. But imagine if they're not recorded. Imagine if nobody ever knows about them. Amen. Imagine if they're never acknowledged by anyone. Oh, Did you still know that God used your life? And that the satisfaction you have at 90, if you get to live that long, when you're breathing your last breath, is knowing you walk with God? Amen. More, come on. You won't care about the list of accolades. None of those things will impress you at all. They impress men in their more immature seasons of life. They become very unimpressive in the later years of life. Yeah, that's right. Very unimpressive. You just want to walk with God. Yes. Come on. And men of God that spend most of their life traveling and doing great evangelistic campaigns, when you listen to their testimonies, what they long for in their latter years was when they were done the final night of the revival and they could just go back to their quiet, small house and be alone with their God. That's how these men chose to die. We got to believe and we got to walk with God. Our final couple of scriptures are going to involve walking with God. And I'm asking you, church, to consider greatly what it means to have faith that is just built upon intimacy with the Lord and being under the authority of Yahweh God of Israel. That my dear brothers and sisters, the produce of true biblical faith, it allows for supernatural signs and wonders to follow your life. Mm -hmm. It will allow that. But it's our great desire to go in the name of Jesus with the kind of faith that moves mountains. Yeah. Yeah. Trusting in the Holy Ghost to perform everything that he desires to perform. Church, let's go to Hebrews chapter 11 and prepare your hearts for the close of this message. Yeah, I, want, I want everyone to pick up this device if you have one. And just hold it up in the air. And then crotch it. And you're free to to put it down if you can confidently say that it doesn't interrupt your intimacy with the Lord. We, we, we just said, we just said, Pastor Zeke just, just told us that our faith is built upon our intimacy with the Lord. Sometimes we, you can put them down. Put them down as hard as you want. Um, sometimes we can be willing to trust the Lord. Right. And we think we're trusting the Lord. But we're willing to trust the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. The difference between trusting the Lord and being willing to trust the Lord 
When you trust the Lord, you have some inkling of an idea that he's doing something and what he's doing. When you're willing to trust the Lord, you're waiting to figure out what he's doing, if he's doing something. And the lack of intimacy is what leaves you in that place. Like, I would trust him. I just, I don't, I don't know what's going on. So you talk with so much clarity about what God's doing in your lives and your hearts and what he wants from you. And, and I love that and I desire that. And I'm just waiting for the Lord to speak that to me. And the Lord is saying, I'm waiting for you to give me your ear. Mm. Now, we could convict ourselves over this any single day. And maybe we, we should let the Spirit do that. But we can visit it every day and realize this is probably getting in your way. It's getting in my way. And the, if, if our faith is built upon our intimacy with the Lord, yeah. then how seriously do we really want to trust the Lord? Or do we want to remain in that? I'm willing if he ever asks anything of me, here I am, Lord. The Lord says, I've been asking for a long time. been trying. Anyway, you in Hebrews 11. Yeah. Hebrews 11, verses 4 and 5. By faith. Everyone say faith. Faith. Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous. God testifying about his gifts. And through faith... Though he is dead, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death. And he was not found because God took him up. For he obtained the witness that before his being taken up, he was pleasing to God. You have two men here. Abel occurs in Genesis chapter 4. Enoch occurs in Genesis chapter 5. Abel offers an acceptable offering. A sacrifice to the Lord. God receives his offering and by receiving it, declares that Abel's offering was acceptable. By faith, Abel offered this offering. Now, Abel, Abel, I'm sure, named and claimed. I'm going to give this offering to the Lord. And in the name of Jesus, my brother's going to kill me. Probably not. A man, though, who was commended as faithful. A man who obtained a testimony that God would declare, this was a righteous man. Amen. God declares, Amen. through the story of Abel, this man was a righteous man. His faith and his offering were acceptable to me. Righteous man. God declares that of Abel. Amen. The outcome of Abel's offering on this earth was his blood was spilled. Because of his vengeful and jealous brother. Then we have Enoch. Who is commended as faithful. Who receives a testimony. A witness that says. This man Enoch was faithful. What was the outcome of Enoch's life? <laughs> the rapture. <laughs> the biblical rapture. <laughs> He was raptured up. I guess, well. He was not. He was not, but his clothes were. <laughs> oh. Abel. Oh, did he? <laughs> we see these two stories. It's, I think it's interesting that it's Hebrews 11, verses 4 and 5. You have a man who by his faith is declared by God as a righteous man, and he's killed. The very next verse, you have a man who by his walk and his faith is declared by God to be a righteous man, and he never sees death. What in the world? But they both had the same faith. So, I want you to listen to Genesis 5, verses 22 through 24. Then Enoch walked with God... 300 years. Just stop right there. Okay. So Enoch, at 65 years old, has a son named Methuselah. And after Methuselah is born, it says, this is verse 22, then Enoch walked with God 300 years after he became the father of Methuselah. That's, like, we're looking like, well, yeah, but did he push any pillars down and kill Philistines? Did he, did he throw any stones at giants? No. But he walked with God for 300 years. Come on. Like, that's kind of funny, but then also, oh my goodness. Wow. Yeah. He was a faithful man 
walked with the God of the universe for 300 years. Acceptable wow. in the sight of God, living a life for 300 years. Wow. That is an accomplishment. Wow. I don't care who you are. That's good. And then it says, he had other sons and daughters, so all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. He was never found. The Lord just took him up into heaven. He never saw death, is what Hebrews tells us. Now, I'm talking about these things because the, the outcomes of these two men's faith are very different. In, in some way, they're very different. One of them suffers persecution for righteousness sake and is murdered the other one never sees death but they have the same faith yeah. and the scripture says that they were both they both obtained the witness or obtained the testimony hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 says that by faith the men of old gained a good Testimony. Yeah. That's what it says. The men of old were commended by their faith. Yeah. Yep. It is faith that gains for you. So your trust in the Lord is what gains for you a testimony that is good. A testimony yeah. that says you are righteous. Right. And you know the best part about that testimony? It's not just some random Joe saying that you are a good that you are a good man and a righteous yeah. man. It is that you are commended by God yeah. Himself. Yeah. It is God's testimony. Right. That's a really good testimony. Yeah. If God speaks that you're righteous, yeah. then every mouth is shut. Yeah. And if there's anyone open, they're praising him. Yeah. For his declaration that you are righteous. Why are you righteous? Not because you claimed that you were going to kill some giant and then you did. No, you claim that I am going to do as my God has required Amen. of me, Amen. no matter the season of my life, for as long as he requires it. And I will finish my course in this fashion, whether it's met by death or by life. I know that I will be found pleasing in his sight should I be obedient to him. Yeah. You are leaving the outcomes to him. Yeah. And by this, you obtain a testimony, a declaration that says you are righteous. Mm -hmm. We're after, what is the outcome that you're after? What you want to hear is, well done, my good and faithful servant. Yeah. That's what you want to hear. Yeah. You could say, uh, you could have a billion YouTube views, right? Nobody in here wants that. Yeah. You know? But you could have all these accolades. You can gain so, Pastor Deacon and I were talking this morning, you can gain so much so quickly in this world, in the age in which we live. You can become famous overnight. People can admire you and then hate you in the same day. So quickly. True faith is, has nothing to do with what you achieve and how long it takes you to achieve it. True faith is, can you do what the Lord has asked of you and do it before Him, for Him? Amen. For an unspecified amount of time. <laughs> until He calls you home, until, you're, until your objective is completed, either because your blood has been spilled or He called you up. Amen. Go to Philippians chapter 1. Let's stand to our feet as we... Uh